Chapter Twenty Five of the Convict by G. P. R. James. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Chapter Twenty Five. At the end of the stone passage, Edgar found Martin Oldkirk waiting for him, and proceeding in silence, they issued forth from the old workhouse, but not by the front entrance, passing through a small door at the back, the key of which the countryman seemed to possess for his own private use as he put it in his pocket after having turned it in the lock as soon as they were a few steps from the building edgar turned towards his companion saying i must find lane the blacksmith to-night i suppose my shortest way is through langley no sir answered oldkirk i will show you a shorter way than that and i had better go with you too for if i don't you'll not make much of edward lane we must take the first turning through the fields there's a stile a couple of hundred yards up without reply edgar proceeded along the road and they had nearly reached the stile of which old kirk spoke when four or five men and a little boy sprang out from the hedge upon them two of them seized edgar by the collar and though he made an effort to shake himself free it is probable he would have offered no violent resistance if old kirk had not struck violently right and left knocking down one of the assailants and severely hurting another the men struck again in their own defence and a general scuffle took place in the midst of which without knowing from what hand it came edgar received a severe blow on the head from a stick the fire flashed from his eyes his brain seemed to reel and everything passing from his sight he fell senseless to the ground when mr adelon recovered his recollection he could not for some minutes conceive where he was for all the objects around were new and strange to him he was stretched upon a bed in a large but low-roofed room with a woman and two men standing by him and applying some cold lotions to his head his brain seemed confused and dizzy and a violent aching pain over his brows showed him that he had been very severely handled the remembrance of all that had occurred came back to him almost immediately and turning to one of the men he demanded where he was and why he had been so assaulted you are at farmer grange's for the present master replied the man and no one would have hurt you if you had not resisted we came out to get hold of a party of those chartists who were charged with being concerned in that business at barhampton and if you choose to go consorting with them you must take the consequences have you a warrant demanded edgar raising himself on the bed we've got warrants against five or six on em answered the man martin oldkirk neddy lane eaton and others have you a warrant against me demanded edgar though i need not ask the question for i know very well you have not as to that i can't say was the man's answer for i don't know who you are yet but you were consorting with one of em at all events you know very well that i am sir arthur adelon's son replied the young gentleman and i demand that you show me your warrant against me if you have one i shall submit to the law of course but if you have not i insist upon your suffering me to go home directly that i shan't do you may be sure said the man i don't know who you are or anything about you and i shall wait till the constable of the hundred comes back at all events he's gone to barhampton to find a surgeon for your head that you would have broke whether we liked it or no he won't be long i dare say and you must stay quiet till he returns resistance would be in vain Ed edgar well knew and he was forced to submit though most unwillingly but gradually a stronger power mastered him violent and general headache came on a sensation of feverish languor spread over his limbs and by the time that the little clock which was ticking against the wall struck two he felt that he was almost incapable of moving in about half an hour afterwards the head constable of the hundred came back from barhampton with the surgeon who was accustomed to attend sir arthur adelon's family and after examining his patient's head and having felt his pulse asking two or three questions at the same time as to what sensations he experienced he drew forth his lancet and proceeded according to the old practice to bleed his patient largely 
whether the custom of so doing be good or not edgar adelon certainly felt great relief though a degree of faint drowsiness spread over him at the same time to his inquiry as to whether he could not be moved to brandon the surgeon shook his head saying impossible and edgar then proceeded to complain of the manner in which he had been treated by the constable and those who accompanied him in the midst of his statement however the overpowering sensation of weariness which he felt prevailed over even anger on his own account and anxiety for his friend his eyelids dropped heavily once or twice and he fell into a profound sleep when he woke on the following morning it was broad daylight and he found mr filmer sitting by his bedside his head still ached but he felt better than on the preceding night and a long explanation ensued as to the occurrences which had brought him into the state in which mr filmer found him as it was clear no warrant was out against him and the men who had apprehended him had retired from the farmhouse somewhat apprehensive of the consequences of what they had done edgar expressed his determination to rise immediately and pursue the object which he had in view when he was seized he explained in general terms to his companion the nature of the business he was upon and no arguments of the priest bearing upon the state of his own health and the danger of the step he proposed would have had any effect had not mr filmer added the assurance that mr dudley's trial would not come on for several days as he had received intimation that very morning that it was far down on the list and that all the chartists who had been taken at barhampton were to be proceeded against in the first instance besides edgar he said the object you have in view can perhaps be more easily attained if you will tell me the name of the man you are seeking i will go to him myself and find means one way or another to bring him hither to speak to you the idea seemed to edgar a good one for in truth he felt little equal to the task and after a few words more of explanation mr filmer set out upon his errand as he went edgar turned his eyes towards the clock and perceived to his surprise that it was nearly noon but the priest did not return till the sky was beginning to grow grey and then brought the unpleasant intelligence that edward lane was nowhere to be found he has probably heard of there being a warrant out against him mr filmer said and has concealed himself till these assizes are over knowing well as we all know that it is one of the bad customs of this country whatever be the government to let political offenders off easily if they avoid the first pursuit of justice while those who are early apprehended have the law administered not only with strictness but with passion i must find him at all events said edgar and that speedily i shall know where he is by to-morrow morning replied mr filmer with a meaning smile i have directed several shrewd and trustworthy members of my own flock who know him well to obtain information and communicate it to me at once i will let you know my dear son so make your mind easy for not an hour shall elapse after i have received the intelligence before it is in your possession again edgar adelon suffered himself to be tranquillized by assurances which would have had no effect had he not been enfeebled by illness the next morning when he woke his headache was gone and his mind was fresh and clear but he still felt very feeble and willingly lay in bed till the good farmer's wife brought his breakfast and the hour appointed for the surgeon's visit had nearly come he wondered indeed that mr filmer had not been with him that eda had neither come nor sent and the doubts which she had raised regarding the sincerity of the priest began to recur unpleasantly to his mind he became uneasy restless and when the medical man at length arrived three-quarters of an hour after his time he shook his head saying you are not quite so well to-day mr adelon and must remain perfectly quiet it is lying here idle answered edgar adelon when i have many important things to do i should be quite well were i up you must rise on no account to-day replied the surgeon and indeed i am very glad to find that you did not get up which i almost anticipated you might do as i am a little later than the hour i appointed 
i know your impatient spirit of old my young friend and he smiled facetiously i certainly thought you never would come replied edgar and the surgeon fearful that he might have given some offence to the son of a wealthy patient hastened to explain the fact is he said that i was anxious to hear the trial of some of these chartists and rode over to blank early this morning i was detained however longer than i expected by a poor woman who is suffering under but what came of them exclaimed edgar adelon eagerly well knowing that when the worthy gentleman got upon an interesting case there was no end of it the chartists i mean were any of the trials over oh no answered the surgeon their trials are put off till the next assizes the case of your acquaintance mr dudley was just coming on i should have stayed on to hear it if i had had time but as i promised to be over here by eleven i hurried away otherwise i would have brought you all the news he spoke in the most commonplace tone in the world and edgar at that moment hated him mortally but he said not another word and kept his eyes shut almost all the time that his surgeon remained as if he were inclined to go to sleep again as soon as the man of healing was gone however he sprang up in his bed hurried on his clothes and without even waiting to wash himself or brush his hair surprised the good woman of the house by appearing in the kitchen of the farm la sir she exclaimed i am glad to see you up again i hope you're better oh yes quite well now thank you mrs grange replied the young gentleman with a swimming head and a feeling of faint weakness in all his limbs i am going out to take a ride if your husband will lend me a horse that he will i am sure sir answered the farmer's wife and running to the window of the kitchen she screamed out into the yard grange grange here is mr adelon quite well again and wants you to lend him your nag to take a ride certainly wife answered the farmer coming out of the barn on the opposite side of the court when will he like him directly answered edgar adelon eagerly and speaking over the good woman's shoulder it will refresh me and do me good he shall be up in a minute then sir answered the farmer i am glad to see you well again i'll just take some of the hair off his heels and comb out his mane a bit but edgar did not stay to hear more and hurrying back into the room to which he had been first taken sought for his hat which he found sadly battered and soiled without waiting even to brush off the dirt he proceeded at once to cut short the farmer's unnecessary preparations and mounting the horse as soon as he could obtain it rode away at a quick trot towards the county town he knew not what he sought he had no definite object in going but he felt that he had been deceived that he had been kept in idleness while the fate of his friend was in jeopardy and his impatience increased every moment till the farmer's nag was pushed into an unwanted gallop he slackened his pace a little it is true as he entered the town but still rode very fast to an inn close by the courts and ringing the bell furiously gave his horse to the hostler in a few moments he was pushing his way through the crowd in the entrance and the next instant he caught sight of dudley standing with his arms crossed upon his chest and his eyes fixed upon the jury box his brow was calm but very stern there was no fear in his fine eyes but they were grave even to sadness on the opposite side were the jury with their foreman leaning a little forward and at the same instant a voice coming from just below the bench demanded in a loud tone how say you gentlemen of the jury guilty or not guilty guilty of manslaughter my lord replied the foreman the eyes of edgar adelon turned dim his brain reeled and he fell back amongst the crowd without uttering a word End of chapter twenty five Chapter twenty six of the convict by G. P. R. James. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Chapter twenty six. Two years had passed. Two years. What is it? Who can say? Different to every being in the whole wide range of universal existence, 
time is a true chameleon and takes its colour entirely from the things through which it glides now grey and dull now bright and shining now purple with the mingled hues of exertion and success rosy with love and hope or azure with faith and confidence years what are they nothing for to many they have no existence mere spots in the wide ocean of eternity which realize the mathematician's utmost abstraction when he defines a point as that which hath no parts or which hath no magnitude neither length breadth nor thickness yet to others how important are years how full of events and feelings and actions how often is it that in that short space of two years a life is crowded so that when we look back at the end of mortal existence there gathered into those four-and-twenty months stands out the whole of active being and all the rest is idleness and emptiness the broad selvages of the narrow strip of cloth two years too viewed from different positions in the wide plain of life how different do they appear the prospective and the retrospective changes them entirely it is the looking up and looking down a hill for the perspective of time is very different from that of substantial objects the vanishing point comes close to the eye when we gaze back is far far removed when we gaze forward at every period of life too it changes and with every feeling of the heart with every passion of our nature to the young man the two years just passed stretch far away filled with incidents and sensations all bright in their novelty and vivid to the eye of memory to the old man they are but a space and that space empty he hardly believes that the time has flown which has brought him two strides nearer to the grave say to the eager and impetuous youth two years must pass before you can possess her whom you love and you spread out an eternity before him full of dangers and disappointments tell the timid clinger to life's frail thread you can but live two years longer and the termination seems at the very door pain pleasure hope fear thought study care anxiety our moral habits our corporeal sensations our thirsty wishes our replete indifference all contract or expand the elastic sphere of time and we find at last that it is but a phantasm the sole existence of which is in change the sun and the moon and the stars were given we are told to be for signs and for seasons and for days and for years the regularity was given to their motions that order might be in variety but variety is not less infinite because all is rendered harmonious and regular recurrence only serves to work out spaces in the ever teeming progress of change it is not alone that the vast whole does not present at any time two things exactly alike but it is that all things in that whole and the whole itself are altering every instant and every fraction of an instant which gives us the infinity of variety all is in movement upon throughout and round the earth all is undergoing change but it is the vastness the violence the rapidity of that change which marks time or in other words marks the march of the shadow two years have passed with their changes and of those i shall speak hereafter suns had set and risen day and night had been months had succeeded weeks hearts were cold that were then warm eyes were dim that were then bright the shade of grey had come upon the glossy hair sickness and health had changed places in many a frame states had seen revolutions men had perished and been born vice and virtue had triumphed or had failed monarchs had died and good and wise men passed away shipwreck and flame and war and pestilence and accident and sorrow had done their part and bursting forth again from a thousand different sources the teeming life of earth had sprung up and glittered in the sun as if but the more abundant for that which had been abstracted from it the world had grown older but not less full 
and those who had aided the work and had undergone the change were hardly conscious that it had taken place two years had passed End of chapter twenty six Chapter twenty seven of the Convict by G. P. R. James. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Chapter twenty seven. It was evening. The sky was of a deep purple, seldom seen in any part of the northern hemisphere. There was a line of light upon the western sky, not yellow, not red. I know not the name of the colour. It was dying day colour the last gleam of the eyes of expiring light everything was solemn and grand there was a deep stillness in the air a vastness in the wide expanse a profundity in the hues of every object a silence and a grandeur in the whole that sank into the soul and filled the mind with imaginings melancholy though grand one might stand there and fancy oneself the first or the last of created beings upon earth with the first or the last sunset before him it was a mountain top high over the flat lands around starting up from the scrub abrupt and precipitous and wherever the eye turned there was neither road nor living thing nor human habitation not an insect was heard there was no wind in the heavens the trees rested motionless not a lizard was seen upon the rocks dark waves of magnificent vegetation flowed away like a sea from the feet and a distant glimpse of the austral ocean with the light of the sinking sun skipping along over its vast solitary bosom was the only thing that relieved the magnificent monotony and yet it was a sea without a sail without an oar ten steps farther and the summit would be gained the ten steps were taken and then all was changed another scene broke upon the view infinite in its variety magnificent in its colouring and varied by life but what life not that of man not that of any creature which holds familiar intercourse with him the savage beast and the wild bird of the wilderness were there but neither flocks nor herds nor but nor mansion nor anything to show that the human foot had ever pressed before that beautiful and awful scene there in centuries long past had flamed the wild volcano lifting up its beacon tower of flame over the untravelled seas of the far south there had poured the torrent of the red lava there had heaved and panted the earthquake ere the fire burst forth there perhaps from the depth of the ocean had been hurled up in the last fierce struggle which burst the gates of the prison-house and set free the raging spirit of the flame the mighty masses of rock piled upon rock precipice above precipice coral and lava limestone and basalt the floor-work of the waters mingling in rifted masses with the barriers that hemmed it in and all cemented together by a stream of manifold materials fused in the internal fire towering up in wild irregular walls assuming strange shapes but everywhere gigantic in size the crags of lava surrounded a vast profound basin the crater of the extinct volcano precipice upon precipice jagged rock rising beside jagged rock formed the ramparts and the embrasures of the desert fortress and the eye of the wanderer as he looked down caught suddenly a scene the most opposite in the hollow space below where soft green turf of the richest verdure carpeted the bosom of the cavity till it reached the brink of the deep dark lake that filled up half the expanse opposite and surrounding about three-quarters of the lake rose precipitous cliffs of pure white coral some seventy or eighty feet in height looking down into and reflected from the waters and as if to make them harmonize with the solemn gloom of that still tarn every here and there a large white bird skimmed over the waves and carried a line of light along with it there was something which moved too under the nearest clump of tall trees which were scattered wide apart over the carpet of verdure but a mass of rock which rolled down from the wanderer's foot scared the creature which had caught his eye and its wild and enormous bounds showed him in an instant that it was not as he had fancied and feared 
a human being like himself. He had but little cause to fear. Never had the spot been visited by anything in the form of a man, unless it were the wildest and lowest of the race, the Australian savage, and that but rarely, if at all. Amidst the solitary peaks of Mount Gambier, he stood alone, perhaps the first since the creation who ever set a footstep there. As he gazed towards the west, the sun sank, and a greenish shade spread over the blue. He cast his eyes over the land through which he had lately passed. It was all one grey, indistinct mass. He looked down into the vast hollow of the hills. The colouring had suddenly faded, and darkness filled the chasm. But then, as if in comprehension, the moment after came forth the stars, large and lustrous bursting forth all at once and spangling both the bosom of the heaven and the deep waters of the lake below here will i live or die said the wanderer it matters not which and placing his bundle under his head he laid himself down beneath the edge of the rock and gazed up towards the sky End of chapter twenty seven Chapter Twenty Eight of *The Convict* by G. P. R. James. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Chapter Twenty Eight. A heavy dew fell during the night, and when the wanderer, whom we have seen climb that steep hill on the preceding evening, woke on the following day, his clothes were full of moisture, and his limbs felt stiff and weary. If he had desponded on the night before, it was well nigh despair that he now felt. He rose slowly and gazed over the scene around him, the vast, voiceless solitude, and there was no comfort in it. He felt the spirit of desolation spreading its icy influence more and more strongly every moment over his heart, and he knew that if he gave way to it, even in the least, it would overwhelm him entirely, would put out strength and effort, hope, action, life itself, and yet he scarcely knew why he should struggle. The voice of despair still asked him what he had to live for. Every earthly object of existence seemed gone. Why should he struggle to preserve that which had become valueless? Who would covet, he asked himself, the possession of a desert? And what is life to me but one tract of very barrenness? Strange when the mood is nicely balanced, how small a grain of dust will turn the scale. A memory came upon him as the words passed his lips, a memory of early years, when, in the wanton spirit of youth, almost of boyhood, he had pictured to himself the free life of the children of Ishmael as an object of wild desire. And now he asked himself, who would covet the possession of a desert? He recollected how he had dreamed of scouring the wide sands upon his fleet steed, climbing the red rocks, resting in his light tent and living a life of free enjoyment and unrestrained exertion the remembrance changed the current of his feelings and gazing forth over the scene around lit up and brightened with the rising sun he asked himself another question why should i not in the midst of this vast and beautiful solitude realize those visions of my early youth alas long since then experience and passion and many a sweet and many a bitter lesson had placed in his hands the keys of other enjoyments he had tasted the food which makes early pleasures insipid and when he thought again of those very simple dreams he felt that there would be something wanting even in their fulfilment where were the friendly and the kind where were the bright and beloved where were the dear companionships where the elevating society where the food for the thoughts where the employment for the mind above all where was the honoured name the respect the esteem which had once been his and he felt too bitterly that what has been must still be had even for peace that it is deprivation not denial of joys that is unhappiness could he consent to live on in such circumstances was there anything within the scope of probability 
which could make life endurable could he debase himself to the sordid joys of those around him could he live a life of slavery and labour with that barrier placed at the end of the course of exertion and obedience which limited the utmost range of hope and expectation to free association with the low the vile and the base to the accumulation perhaps of dross to become a great man among the meanest of his race that was not to be thought of and what was the alternative to live a roving life in the bush companionless if not with savages the most debased and barbarous of the human race to fly the face of civilized man as a pestilence to have neither acquaintances nor friends no social life no love solitude solitude it is a lovely thing to abstract contemplation the mind of man not called upon to try the vast experiment looks upon it as though every great endeavour as bringing a reward with it equal to the difficulties and the impediments but brought nearer placed within the reach of effort we cannot grapple with the mighty task the feeble heart shrinks from it the firm mind doubts and hesitates we feel how sad and terrible it is to be alone we learn that it is the antithesis of our nature it were better to die he thought there were hopes beyond the grave which taught him that death was not solitude that kindly voices would hail his coming that purified from all earthly imperfections friendships high and holy the friendships of the just made perfect would console him for the loss of earthly esteem but in life there was love too human passionate love and when he asked himself what was to make up for that the mind paused and pondered let us not blame him that he was still a being of clay that he could not shake off the affections of this earth that he could not altogether wish to die while affections deep and strong bound him to the state of being in which god had placed him that was the only tie to life yet left unsevered but at the last it was the strongest he had often thought of these things before he had often asked himself will she too believe me guilty will she cast me from her heart as society has cast me from its bosom will she forget me will she wed another and the deep love within his breast imaging that of another had ever answered no 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 it cannot be the same voice was still strong but yet there was a languor a depression spreading over his whole frame which dulled his ear even to the voice of the siren hope though she might love him said despair what chance did there exist of his ever seeing her again condemned for life unable to return marked out as a felon sent as a convict to a distant land without means without object in return what could he do his heart sunk at the thought he must wither out there there in the midst of that wild solitude falling back daily as the progress of man advanced to avoid recognition and fresh anguish he thought not it is true of raising his hand against his own life such a purpose never presented itself as a temptation he had too much faith but he felt disposed to give up all exertion to yield without a struggle to his adverse fate to lay himself down and die still however one boy said live and the last spark of human hope was fanned into a flame faint but yet sufficient to light him to exertion with feeble hands and weary limbs he opened the knapsack which he had brought thither took out the axe which was strapped upon the top and then from the inside drew slowly forth some lines and fish-hooks saying to himself the good old man thought he bestowed an invaluable present on me when he gave the means of supporting life but yet i could hardly feel grateful for the gift i will not hesitate however between two courses and as i have determined to live will make an effort to save life in truth he knew not well how to set about his task the first thing indeed was to build himself a cabin and choosing out an indentation of the rock through which no wet seemed to have percolated he resolved to fix his residence there at least for the first by doing which he was likely to spare much labour enclosing it only on one side 
he chose young and slight trees from amongst the infinity which grew around and sharpened some of them for palisades after he had hewn them down with the axe but ere he had half completed even the necessary preparations he felt faint and weary and though not hungry he resolved to see if he could procure some food to renew his strength choosing out a thin and pliant sapling he descended towards the bank of the lake slowly and with great difficulty for the precipices were tremendous and the natural paths few at length however he accomplished it and then came the question when he reached the brink of the clear and limpid waters of what was to be his bait the sorrow which approaches despair is often bitterly imaginative and as he sat with his head resting on his hand and pondered he thought of all the baits with which man is angled for and caught by his great enemy in the world and oftentimes a rueful smile came upon his fine but worn countenance in which he himself and passages in his past existence shared the sarcasm with his fellow men the sun rose while he thus wasted time and pouring into the crater filled it with ardent light he felt very thirsty and kneeling down upon the brink which was covered with soft turf he drank of the clear wave as he did so a large fly of a peculiar golden colour skimming away settled on the face of the windless waters at a short distance and instantly a fish springing half out of the lake enclosed it within its voracious jaws we are all destroyers thought the wanderer and looking along the banks he caught one of the same insects fastened it to the hook upon his line the line to the rod and cast the baited snare upon the clear bosom of the water the living objects of man's chase have doubtless their traditions but the fish of that lake had never been taught human guile and the instant the hook touched the water a large animal was upon it to draw it to the shore cost the weak and weary man a considerable effort but another and another both considerably smaller were soon after taken and satisfied with his spoil he slowly ascended the steep paths again toward the place where he had commenced building his hut he had observed at that spot a tree some of the branches of which had been shivered by the lightning and with these he contrived to light a fire and prepare his meal after partaking of it frugally he once more set to work again to construct a dwelling which would give him a shelter from the not unfrequent storms of that land and afford a defence against wild beasts or wilder men during the night it was as may well be conceived of the rudest and the simplest kind the stakes he planted side by side at a short distance from the rock where a ledge of coral projecting at the height of seven feet overhung the turf about two yards and formed a sort of roof the door puzzled him greatly for though he remembered well the expedients of the solitary mariner in juan fernandez and often in thought drew a comparison between his own fate and that of crusoe yet he was destitute of many of the implements which the other had possessed his axe and two gimlets had been given him in compassion by an old inhabitant of a very distant part of the colony and these with a large knife formed all his store of tools when the palisade was up however and the space left open at first between the edge of the ledge and the top of the posts had been covered over with twisted branches the little strength which had been left was exhausted and he lay down to rest beneath the shelter of a blackwood tree weariness and heat soon produced their usual effect and he slept it was about three o'clock his rod and fishing line lay beside him as well as the axe with which he had worked and the chips and fragments of the small trees he had cut down were scattered all around he had slept for a full hour and during that time a change to him of considerable importance had taken place in the scene no human eye beheld it but a large bird of prey which was soaring aloft over the heights of mount gambier saw a party ride rapidly through the plains below and halt upon the first acclivity of the mountain it consisted of six persons only one of whom seemed of superior rank there were however nine horses three of which carried heavy burdens consisting of sacks bags and cases each of the horsemen had a gun over his shoulder and as soon as they had drawn the rein they sprung to the ground and commenced unloading the baggage 
amongst which was found a small tent requiring nothing for its erection but one of those poles that, that were easily to be procured in the neighbouring woods we shall have plenty of time to go up and come down again before it is dark said the chief person of the party speaking to one who seemed to be a servant give me the other gun maclean we may get some specimens i must have some more caps too for these will not fit it after a few more words and directions to the other men the leader and two more commenced the ascent of the hill which from the spot they had already reached to the summit did not occupy more than three-quarters of an hour and then the stranger turned round and gazed saying to himself how magnificent i think we'd better get on captain said his servant maclean the sun's getting down and we shan't have much time pooh nonsense answered the other looking at his chronometer it is only a few minutes past four this is the twenty-first of december midsummer day and we shall have light till half-past nine or longer we are a good bit farther north than we were at hobart town five days ago sir replied the servant seeing that his master still paused to gaze and you will not have so much light as you think for well it does not much matter answered the officer a good-looking young man with a very intelligent and benevolent expression of countenance we can find our way down i dare say even in the dusk especially if they light a fire to cook the kangaroo he paused for a moment and then said in a meditative tone i dare say we are the first human beings certainly the first europeans who ever set their feet upon this hill i don't think it sir replied maclean who had taken a step or two nearer to the high precipitous rocks which surrounded the vast crater indeed exclaimed his master what makes you think so my good friend that captain answered the man pointing with his finger to a spot on the ground a little to the right of himself and his master on which when captain m turned his eyes that way he saw lying a scrap of paper with something written upon it on taking it up he found that it was part of the back of a letter with the english postmark distinct upon it the writing consisted only of a few words or rather fragments of words being a portion of the original address and it stood thus Blank Lee, Esquire, Brandon House, Onshire. It signified very little to the eyes that saw it, for he knew not where Brandon House was, nor anything about it. But yet what strange feelings did the sight of that letter call up in his breast? Where was the writer? Where the receiver of that letter? Who could he be? What had become of him? What brought him there? were questions which the mind asked instantly with a degree of interest which no one can conceive who has not stood many thousand miles from his own land and suddenly had it and all its associations brought up by some trifling incident like this that i relate putting his gun under his arm and beholding the paper still in his hand captain m walked slowly and thoughtfully on passed through a break in the high wall of rocks and gazed down into the basin of the mountain the magnificence of the scene was gradually drawing his mind away from other thoughts when his servant touched his arm and said in a low voice we had better be a little upon our guard sir for there are more people about us than we know of and i have heard that our friends who take to the bush are worse devils than the people of the country and they are bad enough look down there and you will see the axe has been at work ay and there's a man lying under that tree he looks mighty like as if he were dead i see i see answered captain m you stay here with johnston while i go on put a ball in each of your guns however in case of the worst though i don't think if we do not injure them they will try to do any harm to well-armed men i wouldn't trust them replied the servant but we'll keep a lookout sir and i think i could put a ball in an apple at that distance captain m advanced quietly not wishing to wake the man if he were sleeping till he was close to him and so profound was his slumber that the young officer gazed on him nearly for a minute without his having heard the approach of any one at length captain m stooped down and shook him gently by the arm the other instantly starting up and laid his hand upon the axe by his side but the officer at once addressed him in a kindly tone saying do not be alarmed it is a friend 
a friend answered the stranger rising to his full height with the axe in his hand and gazing at him from head to foot that is a word easily said but here it cannot be a true one i have no friends sir in that perhaps you are mistaken answered captain m as for myself i trust i am a friend to the whole human race but what i meant to say was that i am not an enemy that one understands answered the other though it is somewhat difficult too in a land where nature seems to have planted fraud and enmity amongst the human race and to which other countries send the off-scourings of their population to propagate new crimes and even degrade the barbarous wickedness they found the words and the appearance of this strange companion struck the young officer very much his tone was high and proud his look grave and thoughtful and though there was a certain degree of bitterness in what he said yet there was that gentlemanly dignity in the whole which could not be mistaken it is strange to meet you sir in this place said captain m after a moment's thought i had imagined till a moment ago that i was the first european who had ever climbed this hill you are the second i believe answered the stranger i was the first at least i can find no trace of any one of that adventurous race who in pursuit of wealth dominion science pleasure or health penetrate into almost every part of the known world having been here before me then you are alone said his visitor quite replied the other you have men with you i see and he turned his eyes towards the servant and his companion who were standing at a little distance whatever be your object whether you come to take me or are merely here from the curiosity which sets half our countrymen running over the world you have but one man and that a wearied and exhausted one to deal with set your mind at rest replied captain m who saw that there was some lingering suspicion still in the stranger's bosom i have no commission and certainly no wish to disturb you in any way neither did i come to these countries altogether from mere curiosity a desire to benefit my fellow-creatures and a strong interest in the fate of men whose crimes have shut them out from the general pale of society but not i trust from the compassion of their brethren or from the mercy of their god first led me to a neighbouring island and i am extending my wanderings through this uncultivated but beautiful country with the hope of turning to account for others what i have myself observed perhaps you can give me some information and i promise you as a man of honour and a gentleman never to say a word to any one which can do you the least detriment i see you must be a man of superior education and i should imagine of superior rank to those who are usually met with in this country and i am sure after the candid expression of my views and the pledge i have given you will not scruple to say anything that can further my objects i have nothing to say answered the other seating himself where he had before been lying i know little have seen little but all i have seen has been iniquity and villainy and vice and folly and ignorance in high and low master and servant convict and tyrant i am inclined to cry with the psalmist there is none that doeth good no not one captain m smiled somewhat sadly i am afraid you are quite right he answered and it has long been my conviction that the system of what is called convict discipline in these colonies not only does not tend in the slightest degree to reform an offender but tends to degrade his moral character to the lowest possible point it is my belief that even the system followed at a very rude period of our history and when the person sentenced to transportation was actually sold as a slave to the planters of america though corrupt and abominable in a high degree was really less detrimental to the unhappy convict than that upon which we now act i have always held that we have no right to condemn a man's soul as well as his body and i feel that we are here instrumental in plunging those whom we expel from our own country into vice and crimes more horrible than they ever contemplated when they committed the act which brought them hither the stranger smiled brightly you seem to me he said to be the first really benevolent and reasonable man who has visited a place of abominations but even you perhaps have not considered all what little i can tell you i will tell 
Call down your men from above, and seat yourself here by me, and in the face of nature, and of the God who willed it to be very good, I will tell you truly, without even a shade of deceit, all that my own short experience has shown. I cannot do so now, replied Captain M, for I have got more companions below, and must go down to them before it is dark, otherwise they will probably come to seek me. But cannot you go down with us? You shall be kindly treated, I promise, and free to return whenever you please. The stranger shook his head. No, he said, I will never seek man again. I will lie in my own lair like the beasts of the field. Here I have beauty and excellence around me uncontaminated. But wherever man's foot treads, there is violence and evil and corruption. Well, replied the young officer, I will not press you if you do not like it. But if you will permit me, I will come up again tomorrow, and we will talk of all these subjects fully before I go back to Tasmania. There is a surveying vessel off the coast which will wait for me till I come down. But in the meantime, I would fain know what you meant when you said, in speaking of the abominations and evils of the convict system, that I had not considered all. It is probable, indeed, that I have not although I have given great attention to the subject, but I wish to know what it was to which you alluded. The stranger laid his hand on Captain M's arm and said, In the fallibility of human judgment, in the difficulties of proof, and in the imperfection of law, it must often happen, and does often happen, that a man perfectly innocent is condemned with the guilty. Were it only that he had to suffer in person from the sad mistake, the event might be lamented, perhaps excused. But what have those lawgivers and those statesmen to reproach themselves with, who have framed a system which, in all cases of such error, must be fatal to the eternal happiness of the man unjustly condemned, which plunges him into an atmosphere pestilential to every good feeling of the heart, to every high principle, to every religious thought? Do they not know that vice is contagious? have they not inoculated hundreds with the moral plague have they not even denied the sick the help of spiritual physicians in the pest house to which they have confined them i tell you sir it is from this that i have fled innocent of even the slightest offence towards my fellow men though doubtless culpable in many towards my god i could have borne the labour and the slavery and the disgrace if not without murmuring yet with patience but when I found that I was to remain, bound hand and foot, amidst beings corrupted beyond all cure, and daily to accustom my eyes and my mind to scenes and thoughts which could leave no high or holy feeling unblasted in my heart, I said, man has no right to do this, and I broke my chain. Captain M. seemed much moved, and he wrung the stranger's hand hard. I am sorry for you, sir, he said. I am sorry for you. I will come up tomorrow, and we will talk more. In the meantime, tell me what I must call you to myself. I know that many persons in your situation take an assumed name. It is that which I mean. I have taken none, answered the stranger, with a sad smile. And then, pointing to the fish lying on the grass, he added, You must think of me, if we never meet again, as the nameless fisherman of the nameless lake. "'Nay, we shall meet to-morrow, if you are still here,' answered Captain M. "'I shall be here if I am alive,' replied the stranger. "'To-morrow and the next day, and for the years and months to come, till death relieves me. "'But perhaps, even before to-morrow, there may be an end of all. "'I have felt ill. The body has given way beneath the mind. "'The strong rider has well-nigh killed the weak horse. "'And this morning I felt as if I were incapable of any exertion.' I did make it, however, and methinks I am better for my labours. But now, adieu, the sun has reached a point whence his descent will be rapid, and darkness will overtake you if you have far to go. Farewell, answered Captain M. I scarcely like to go and leave you here alone, or to think of what you will have to endure in this solitude, if you persist in remaining here. How you are to procure food, or shelter, or clothing, I do not perceive. The skins of beasts, replied the stranger, will give me clothing good enough for my state. The fish of the lake must give me food. Bread, indeed, I may never taste again. 
but there are fruits and roots which may supply its place then as to shelter the clefts of the rock the caverns by which it is pierced will afford all that i need and as for means and appliances to make these things available nature must furnish and teach me surely i shall not be more helpless than one of the savages of this land they live and i shall live longer at least than is desirable to myself farewell farewell and once more bidding him adieu for the time captain m left him and returned to his people End of chapter twenty eight Chapter twenty nine of the Convict by G. P. R. James. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Chapter twenty nine. The emotions with which Dudley saw the strangers depart were very strong. It seemed like the last glimpse of civilized life to be afforded him. It brought back the memory of happier hours, the pleasant thoughts of early days returned, and as he did not wish that any one should see the strong movements of his heart, he paused for several minutes till he thought the visitor and his party must have descended the hill to some distance and then walking slowly to the top and through the break in the cliffs he followed the track which they had pursued with his eye till it lighted on them and then watched them till they were lost amongst the trees which surrounded the spot where they had fixed their little encampment then turning back to the sort of dwelling-place he had chosen he spread the turf within the enclosures thickly with the leaves which he stripped from the branches kneeling down upon the ground just without the palisade he prayed for about five minutes and then rising watched the sky while it ranged through almost every colour of the rainbow till at length it became grey and knowing that five minutes more would bring darkness he placed his knapsack as a pillow on the leaves and once more laid himself down to sleep slumber was not so easily obtained however as it had been on the night before he felt better in body indeed but more depressed in mind the visit of the stranger had disturbed him rather than calmed him it had roused up regrets which he had laboured to banish it had shown him more forcibly than ever the value of all which he had for ever lost and he lay and meditated painfully for more than one hour at length however he slept and although it lasted not for long his slumber was refreshing shortly after daybreak he was on foot again and felt lighter and easier than on the preceding day prayer was his first occupation and then going down to the banks of the lake he undressed and plunged in swimming boldly as he had been accustomed to do while a student in a civilized land the walk up the hill warmed him again though he had found the water very cold but there was invigorating refreshment in the cool wave and the rejoicing sensation of returning strength diminished to the eye of imagination the dangers of the present the evils of the past and the dreariness of the future when he reached his hut he lighted the fire as before put one of the fish he had caught to broil on the ashes and then sat down to consider what was to be done next tools he wanted of many kinds and weapons for the chase and he saw that notwithstanding all the advantages of education the savage accustomed to depend upon himself alone had great advantages over the european habituated to tax the industry of a thousand hands for the production of every article he used he had learned something indeed of the natural resources of the country of that which it produced spontaneously for the support of life and he doubted not that till the winter came on he should be able to supply himself with all that was needful the intervening time he proposed to devote for preparations against that period when although game might be more easily found the tree and the shrub would refuse all contributions he would fashion for himself a bow he thought tall and strong such as he had drawn in early days he would prepare snares ay and nets perhaps from the fibrous bark of the trees the spoils of the chase should furnish him with clothing and he would lie in wait for the creatures of the wood like the hunters in the days of old he smiled as he thus thought but there was bitterness in it too and rising up he set to work to complete that which the previous evening had left undone 
he had hardly commenced however when the sound of voices calling reached him and looking out from his hut he saw his visitor of the night before with three men each laden with his several burden dudley suspended his labour but did not advance to meet them the society of one he could bear but the presence of many was a load to him there lay the things down under the tree said captain m when they were within about a hundred yards and then go and do as i told you taking care if you find any of the specimens i mentioned not to break the crystals you can return about two till then leave me here without interruption except in case of emergency the men deposited their burdens on the ground and the young officer coming frankly forward to his new acquaintance shook hands with him saying this wild life has a strange charm i think i could go on roving through these scenes as long as life and health lasted do you see that sun asked dudley soaring up from the dark horizon like an eagle from its eyrie do not however suppose it is that which gives the light and beauty you find in these scenes the sun is in man's heart you have no dark shadow on you either innate or accidental you have no foul thoughts to mourn as some in these lands have you have no black cloud hanging over fame and blighting life like myself you have no disappointed hopes and fruitless yearnings for friendships and affections lost for ever to spread the golden pathway of the sky with a dull grey pall well may all seem bright to you you have no despair man should never despair so long as there is a pure spot in his heart replied captain m and the innocent wrongly condemned should despair least of all knowing that there is one who sees where man sees not and who though in wisdom he may chastise yet in his own good time will comfort and raise up it is that faith alone which gives me strength to live replied dudley but yet my fate is sad so sad as to darken all around were it not for that chance of change below which hope ever holds out to the man not utterly lost and for that certainty of change in another world which faith affords to the believer life here to a man wronged and blasted as i have been will be a boon not worth the keeping what have i to look forward to a life of toilful solitude struggling each day for bare subsistence without companionship or sympathy without speech without object without reward and with the high privilege of thought unfruitful except of bitterness and ashes when the time of age and sickness comes too what will be my fate then but i will not think of it i shall be an idiot before that or worse a savage nay i trust not answered captain m if you are innocent as you say sooner or later that innocence will appear and impossible replied dudley i had a fair and impartial trial there was a skilful and well-conducted defence the jury were men of probity and sense the judge mild and equitable all was done that could be done and hope on that side would be worse than vain then you must learn to endure your lot said captain m gravely and to make it as tolerable as possible by your own exertions i can do little to help you or to render it easier but that little i will do i have brought you up a few things that may be a comfort to you for a time and some others which will be of more permanent service i can well spare them for i shall embark to-night and can procure more come and see the little store which though mere trifles may be of much use to you at least till you have become accustomed by degrees to the fate which has fallen upon you dudley followed him with a full heart and sitting down by the bundles which the men had brought up captain m exposed to his companion's eyes what was indeed a treasure to one placed in such strange and fearful circumstances there were blankets against the wintry cold and a rough wrapping coat some packets of common medicines in the small white wood box a hammer a small saw and one or two other tools together with a good knife and a measure there was a case bottle too and a drinking cup and some linen this other packet said captain m contains some books one on the botany of this colony which may be very serviceable to you a single volume of essays some sermons written for the convicts the vicar of wakefield and a bible they will indeed be treasures said dudley with a glad look 
a bible i already possess that has been left to me though i have lost all else and most grateful do i feel for so much kindness sir kindness where i have no right nor title to expect it every man has a right to expect it of his fellow-men answered captain m and i should be worse than a brute if i could refuse it to one circumstance as you are when i will not pretend to doubt your innocence that is strange said dudley thoughtfully that you should not doubt it knowing nothing of me while others who knew much did doubt and yet answered his companion i am not without a reason i have accustomed myself much to observe men and the way in which they act under particular circumstances and i never yet saw one who owned he had a fair and impartial trial in every particular and yet declared himself innocent unless he was innocent there has been always a something which he thought unfair a cause why he has been cast as it is termed either the judge was wrong or the jury was wrong or the witnesses were perjured or the counsel for the prosecution had acted unfairly or something or another had given an unfavourable turn to the trial however i will beg of you to accept of these little articles and moreover this small writing-case with which i have travelled i know not whether it will be useful to you at present being entirely unaware of the circumstances of your case but at a future period it may be most serviceable and even now if you feel inclined to write a few lines to any friend in england i will carry your letter safe to the next post and take care that it shall be forwarded to its destination what can i say asked dudley putting his hand to his brow and speaking as if it were to himself nevertheless i shall write if it be but a few words to tell them that i still live and thanking captain m again and again especially for his last gift dudley seated himself and wrote as follows dear edgar though deprived of the power of seeing you before i went i heard something of your kindness and my heart will ever be grateful i know you have never doubted my innocence nor has Eda. tell her for me that i am innocent and that my innocence and my faith are my only support i have quitted the colony to which i was sent broken in short the bonds which they placed upon me and i am now living in perfect utter solitude tell her i still love her shall always love her yet let her forget me for what but pain can follow remembrance of one so lost to hope and all that brightens earth as edward dudley he folded the letter and addressed it and then gazed at it for a moment with a somewhat puzzled expression of countenance how shall i seal it he said at length you will find wax and a light box in the top of the case answered captain m with a smile that which i provided for a long journey amongst civilized men as well as wild nature may serve you for many months in this solitude for many years said dudley sadly but yet it will be a treasure and a consolation to me even the capability of noting down the passing of the days is something and i thank you from the very bottom of my heart the letter was accordingly sealed and delivered to the charge of captain m who looked at the address with interest thinking as he did so i must inquire into this case for it seems a very strange one in the meantime dudley was gazing at the light-box with a thoughtful air this will be most serviceable too he said at length for i can foresee that in the winter i shall have much difficulty in procuring fire there are no flints here and although i know that the savages can obtain a light by rubbing pieces of dry wood together yet i have seen none that is fit for the purpose i have had great difficulty already in lighting a fire and the scorched branches which afforded me the means of doing so will soon be exhausted i must wrap this little box carefully up so as to keep it from all damp and doubtless the matches will last me through the winter i am sorry there are no more of them answered captain m but at all events they will give you time to learn other contrivances i know not well indeed how you procure food for i suppose you do not live altogether on the produce of the lake i do not propose to do so said dudley for in some seasons i believe it would afford me no supply 
but i must have recourse to the old primeval means the bow and arrows and the snare he added with a smile captain m looked for a moment or two at the fine double-barrelled gun which lay beside him before he answered but then raising his eyes with a frank kind expression he said perhaps i am doing wrong but i cannot make up my mind to leave you altogether dependent upon such very precarious means of support i have said i believe you innocent let me add i feel sure you are a man of honour also and if you will promise me never to use what i am going to give you against human life except in your own defence and especially not against any one sent to take you in case such a thing should ever occur i will leave you this gun and supply you with ammunition you will then be in a condition always to procure food at least the promise he required was readily made and dudley said little more for the feeling of gratitude he experienced was overpowering he sat with his head leaning on his hand buried in meditation and who can trace the wild range of his thoughts during the few minutes which he thus remained silent his companion saw that his kindness had plunged him into that sort of gloom which is often produced by feelings the most noble and the most tender when they stand strongly contrasted with some dark and irremediable point in the fate of those who experience them and in order rather to rouse him from his reverie than anything else he said i suppose you are well accustomed to the use of a gun i will show you answered dudley who was certainly one of the most skilful marksmen of his day let us walk down the hill we shall doubtless find some game and if you will permit me i will prove that you do not place your gun in inexpert hands willingly replied captain m rising from the ground where he had been seated i am sorry i have not more powder and shot with me but i will leave upon the spot where our little party is encamped all that we have except a few charges which may be necessary as we go down toward the seashore if you are provident it will serve you for some time and ere long depend upon it a population will grow up around you from whom you will be able to obtain fresh supplies this country must be destined to be much more thickly populated very soon the human race is advancing in every direction and the progress already made is marvellous that is the most frightful consideration of all the many which present themselves to the mind in contemplating the present state of the neighbouring colony replied dudley when one thinks of its rapid progress and of the multitude springing up here like a crop of grain and remembers that almost every seed is diseased and the moral condition of almost every human being is either tainted at his arrival or destined soon to be tainted by the contaminating influences to which he is exposed what can we look forward to in the future but a perfect hell upon earth can we expect that without efficient guidance with few means of religious instruction with no moral restraints and no correcting principle but the fear of corporeal punishment destitute of even habitual reverence for probity crowded together in places where virtue and honour and honesty are a scoff and a reproach where the highest distinction is excess in vice or skill in crime can we expect that any man who may become a father will breed his child up in the way that he should go and will not rather infect him with his own vices to be fostered and matured by others equally if not more conversant with crime it is a known fact sir that in the neighbouring colony of van diemen's land the free emigrant of the lower class is looked upon with more doubt and suspicion even than the convict and is nine times out of ten as base and degraded what must the colony become thus constituted and what is the awful responsibility upon a nation which possessing a large i might say an immense extent of fertile and beautiful country plants in it as the germ of future nations all that is wretched abominable and depraved of the mother country denies the wretched men that it sends out the means of amelioration and by every law and ordinance ensures that the pestilence shall be propagated from man to man till none but those who are placed above temptation by superior fortune or superior culture remains unaffected by moral disease more frightful than any plague which ever ravaged the world but how can this be amended 
asked Captain M. "'What are the means?' "'They require deep consideration,' replied Dudley. "'It is the actual state of things which first strikes us. "'The remedies may be long in seeking. "'This is more especially the case when a particular system has long been going on, "'and every attempt at partial reform has but added evil to evil, "'till at length the whole has become intolerable.' The natural process is easily described, and it is only by historically viewing the question that we can see how such monstrous abominations have risen. These things are not done as a whole. It is step by step that they are performed. If man sat down calmly to consider what was best to be done under particular circumstances, if he meditated philosophically upon the object which he proposed to attain, and endeavoured to foresee as far as the shortness of the human view will permit the results of all that he attempts for temporary purposes he might frame and would frame if not a perfect system at least one the defects in which would be comparatively few and easily remedied but what has been usually his course he has considered the temporary purpose alone and that not philosophically in the first institution of transportation his object seemed to be twofold to punish guilty persons and to deliver their country from their presence simple exile was the simplest form in which this could be achieved the next was the selling of the convict for a slave then came the transportation to a colony of the mother country with a prohibition against return otherwise the peopling of a colony with the vicious and the criminal then punishment in the colony was added to mere transportation and in all and every one of these steps nothing was held in view but infliction on the culprit relief to his native land reformation was never thought of degradation was never guarded against the moral condition of the convict or his religious improvement was never taken into consideration nor did the mind of man seem to reach till within the last few years the comprehension of that essential point in the whole question that where the convict was going he was to become the member of a vast community the state and condition of which would for years be strictly connected with that of the country which expelled him none of these things were ever thought of and still less the high and imperative duty which binds legislators to attempt in punishing to reclaim a duty not only to their country and to their fellow men but to their god captain m seemed to ponder over his companion's words for a few moments and then replied i doubt not what you say is true the evils you speak of have arisen in a great part from the want of a due comprehension and consideration of the objects to be obtained but were that all the evils of the system existing would be speedily remedied but i fear there is another great error which statesmen had fallen into and which will ever as long as it is persisted in throw insuperable obstacles in the way of reform the error i allude to is a belief that corporeal punishment will reclaim i am convinced that its only tendency is to degrade and render more vicious the person on whom it is inflicted that it must exist i do not deny for the probability of incurring it must be held up before the convict's view to deter him from adding fresh crimes to those which have gone before but the principal means i would employ would be entirely moral means encouragement to a right course exhortation instruction and the chance of recovering gradually that sense of moral dignity the want of which is a source of all evil a theory which may be pushed too far said dudley though excellent in itself punishment is undoubtedly needful both as a restraint and an act of justice but believe me also that coercion as a means is likewise required i am convinced that in all these matters we try to generalize too much if we consider the infinite variety of human characters we shall see that an infinite variety of means is required in the direction of any large body of human beings to expect that any man or any body of men should be able to scrutinize the character of each individual convict so as to apply the precise method of treatment to his particular case 
would be to require far too much but the rules and regulations adopted by a government and carried out by its officers in the colony should be such as to render the application of particular means as easy as possible entrusted to well instructed and observing men a general knowledge of the character of each convict would be easily obtained from his conduct on his passage and of the crime for which he received sentence the reports thus obtained might form the basis for correct classification on the arrival of each ship and the distribution of the unfortunate men sent out might be afterwards made in accordance with this classification thus you would save those comparatively pure from contamination and you would reduce the number of those requiring strict supervision and coercion to the utmost possible extent you would acquire in fact the power of at once applying the means to the end you would know where moral means would be most efficacious where restraint was most needful and have some guidance for shaping your conduct according to the necessities of the case i am aware indeed that some classification is made but of the most imperfect character and this i look upon as one of the causes of the total failure of the system of transportation i believe also the machinery both for improving the moral conduct of the convict and for preventing crime after his arrival in the colony has been most inadequate from the very beginning i look upon it that one of the greatest possible objects is by constant and active supervision to prevent the possibility of a vicious course being pursued for some time after the convict's arrival in the colony believe me that to dishabituate his mind from the commission of evil is the first step to habituate it to the pursuit of good but what has been the case when first convicts were sent to this colony the period is not very remote it never seemed to enter into the contemplation of those who sent them to afford them any religious instruction and it was entirely owing to the exertions of a private individual that the means of spiritual improvement were provided them at all and now when the influx of these unhappy men into van diemen's land is from five thousand to nine thousand per annum if we look either to the opportunities afforded them of obtaining religious training or to the power granted to the local government of ensuring constant supervision even in the cases of the most hardened and irreclaimable we shall find that it is utterly inadequate to the numbers who require it what can be the result what right have we to expect anything but that which we see with a system founded originally in an incomplete view of the case with an incomplete classification of the persons on whom it is to operate and with the most inefficient means of carrying out the objects which should be ever held in view the failure is inevitable and thus has a place set apart for the reception of criminals whom it was a duty not only to punish but to reform become a mere nest of unreclaimed felons and a school for every species of vice and wickedness which can degrade the human race and bring eternal destruction upon the soul of man the way in which these colonies have been conducted i do not scruple to say is a great national sin which cannot be without its punishment the conversation proceeded in the same strain for some time further during which they made their way slowly downward towards the banks of the lake now pursuing a green path amongst large masses of rock and stone now descending natural steps as it were in the coral rock now pausing to gaze with interest into one of the deep caves which pierced the side of the precipice and in which the light assumed a shadowy red from the hue of the internal walls to two warm-hearted and enthusiastic men a conversation so deeply affecting the best interests of their fellow-creatures was as may well be supposed highly interesting and there was something in the grandeur the wildness and the solitude of the scene which seemed to elevate and expand the thoughts as they reasoned of the destinies of the multitudes fated to be the fathers of a population about ere long to overspread the wide uncultivated tracts around them 
the morning was balmy and refreshing the sun had not yet risen high enough to render the heat burdensome and as their course lay along the eastern side of that wide basin the cool shadows of the rocks and hills and trees spread out long and blue over the rugged precipices and the verdant turf at their feet for a time they forgot the object of their walk but at length dudley pointed to a spot in the sky saying there is a vulture and if you will permit me i will try my skill in bringing him down he will soon come near for i have remarked in travelling hither that in this country the birds of prey whenever they see a moving object approach it rapidly the butchers of the air have not yet learned that there are butchers of the earth more powerful than themselves you had better draw out the balls and put in some plugs said captain m handing him the gun though i suspect he will not come within range i will try the ball upon him said dudley i used not often to miss my mark but it is two long years since i had gun or rifle in my hand and gazing down upon the highly finished fowling piece he thought of the morning when he had gone out to shoot with edgar adelon and all the dark and terrible events which had followed suddenly rousing himself after a few moments he looked up towards the sky again and saw that the bird had approached much nearer skimming along just over the summit of the crags which towered above them and with curved neck and bent head eyeing them as he sailed along dudley put the gun to his shoulder and though captain m remarked he is much too far pulled the trigger after a momentary pause the report was hardly heard before the broad wings fluttered with convulsive beating collapsed and whirling round and round in the air the tyrant of the mountain came thundering down at the distance of some thirty yards from them when they reached the spot where he lay they found him quite dead though the yellow eyes still rolled in the bare skinny head the ball had passed right through him but it seemed that he had recently been inflicting the fate upon some other creature which he had just received himself for his strong horny bill and talons were red with blood which from its fresh appearance could not have been shed very long this would seem a species of condor said captain m after examining it carefully what an immense extent of wing i must carry it away with me as a very fine specimen i thought the condor was confined to south america said dudley but i am very ignorant of such things and certainly he shall not have any temptation to form a museum of natural history i must save whatever powder and shot you can afford me for the sole purpose of obtaining food and refrain from spending it upon my fellow animals of prey it is a condor i think answered his companion and i believe that species is spread more generally over both the old and new world than is supposed they are very rare however everywhere i have seen many strongly resembling this creature hovering about these cliffs and the top of the neighbouring hill answered dudley but of course i never could approach one till now for they did not think fit to attack me and i had no means of bringing them down we will carry it back with us but first i must provide you with some dinner and the lake is my only resource some of the feathers of this good gentleman will make an artificial fly not at all unlike those i saw yesterday on the shore and sitting down by the dead vulture he speedily constructed an insect which had sufficient resemblance to those they were accustomed to devour to deceive the voracious inhabitants of the waters five or six large fish not exactly trout but somewhat resembling that species repaid an hour's angling and then walking back the two wanderers each with his own particular burden made their way to the spot where dudley's fire had been lighted the day before their meal was frugal enough bread they had none their drink was supplied by a little stream issuing from the rocks but yet it seemed pleasant to both and captain m said with a smile when he saw his companion somewhat puzzled as to how he should distribute the food i can see you are not accustomed to this roving life the memory of old habits clings to you still but as far as my experience shows me 
it is wonderfully less tenacious with uncultivated than with cultivated minds a few months is quite sufficient to qualify any convict for a bushranger it would take years so to qualify me replied dudley i affect no particular degree of refinement but i do think the delicacies of life form one of the greatest charms of society they are in fact based upon higher principles than at first appear i believe that they are all founded upon the maxim neither to be nor to seem nor to do anything which can be unnecessarily offensive to others this implies no sacrifice of principle and no unreasonable subserviency of manner for the moment a man tries to bend what is right to what is courteous that instant courtesy becomes a vice but i never yet heard a reasonable opinion which could not be so expressed as to offend no reasonable man and with regard to the minor and to the conventional courtesies to omit them where no wrong is implied would be a violation of that which is due to our fellow-men and to ourselves nevertheless you must not expect towels and water basins in this desert to wash after you have eaten with your fingers any more than you must expect bread where there are no ovens or wine where no grapes grow i am perfectly satisfied answered captain m in a gay tone i shall find my finger-glass at the little stream there and my napkin on the green grass but still my good friend there are several little things which may be serviceable to you in my small encampment down below i shall have no need of them going back so soon and i do heartily believe there are no less than four or five round-pointed table-knives and at least three two-pronged forks some towels too may not come amiss and if ever you should have another dinner-party here they may serve as napkins as well i will leave them on the spot when we go away and you can take possession of them at your leisure i could procure you too a box of nails from the ship but i do not know how to convey them to you without discovering your retreat to those on board and doubtless you would not like to come into too near proximity with the people of the vessel especially as they have orders to search for and seize an escaped convict of the name of brady a most desperate fellow who has hitherto frustrated every attempt to take him he has somehow made his way over hither from van diemen's land at least it is supposed so he has not come to this district as far as i have seen answered dudley but still it would be better to avoid all recognition nevertheless i will admit this box of nails you speak of would be of greater value to me than a box of pure gold and if you will put it on shore at a spot where these two hills are in a direct line with each other i will seek it and bring it away i might say i will hereafter find some way to show my gratitude but now i have none nor any hope of doing so i can therefore but thank you again and again and say would there was a chance of my being able to do that for you and yours which my heart prompts but which my means forbid not for ever not for ever answered captain m i feel very sure that if you but persevere in abstaining from evil a time will come when errors will be removed and truth made manifest beyond the grave answered dudley and then suddenly changing the conversation he carried it on in a somewhat lighter tone till captain m rose to leave him they parted like two old friends who might never meet again and while one carried away a feeling of deep intense interest and curiosity the other remained with a sensation of desolation more profound and painful than ever End of chapter twenty nine